any religion in the world does a few different things. One is that it lays out boundaries for what is right and wrong. And the second is that it sets out a procedure that a person who crossed one of those boundaries of right and wrong can be reconciled to the community or reconciled to the divine. But wherever you find a mechanism to forgive sin, you also find people who are gaining the Christian. We use that assurance of forgiveness as a way of excusing more and more sin. We see this in the life of Israel. Israel has, uh, you might say, two different types of laws. One are the ethical laws, the laws that say what you're supposed to behave like, like the Ten Commandments. And then there are the sacrificial laws. And those are the laws that are designed to help you make amends if you break the ethical laws. But often, it seems like Israel simply baked in the sacrificial costs of getting right with God into, you know, a lifestyle that shows to violate the law. And so if I know that I can simply offer a sacrifice and be absolved of the sin that I did in violation of the ethical laws, then I might simply say, well, it's worth the trade-off and, and go ahead and do that. And so... We see that God becomes fed up with the Israelites as they attempt to gain the system and get away with a sinful life. The prophet Isaiah cries out against Israel as they live this way. In Isaiah chapter 1, starting in verse 13, we read this. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and, Sabbath and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assembly. And skipping there, verse 15, he says, When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. When you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Give the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. The Israelites are practicing the rituals that God instituted. But God won't accept them because those rituals are taking them back to a more just life that are enabling them to live a life of injustice. The rituals are a license for the people to sin with gaining the system. Now, notice that even though God has made allowance for sinners to be made right with him through the sacrificial system, and God seems to be saying, I don't want your sacrifices anymore, God doesn't close the door on forgiveness. He could say, I made a way for you guys to be forgiven. If you've abused the system, so I'm shutting it down, and you can all go to hell. Literally. Instead, he says, no, forgiveness comes by genuine repentance, by turning around your behavior. Wash, he says, and you'll be whiter than snow. Washing, of course, means stopping the oppression of the poor and the outcasts and the vulnerable. And so, Israel's forgiveness is not tied up with the formulaic offering of sacrifices. Instead, it is with a change in the way that they live. This is true for Israel. It isn't true for the church in the age of grace. In the third, I want to look at a story from the New Testament about a person who comes to a place of repentance. And I want to look at how some observations from that story can help us to understand our own call to repentance. So the story I want to look at this morning is the story of Zacchaeus from the Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Read with me. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. 
that the king stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the law. Now, some observations about the story. The first observation is that this act of salvation begins with the initiative of God. The Jesus doesn't ask Jesus to forgive his sins. He does not ask because he probably assumes that he is outside of God's forgiveness. And yet, Jesus comes to him and essentially asks him to invite him. Hey, Jesus, if you invited me over, I would come. So he makes the first move in this drama of salvation. The second thing that I think we should observe from the story is that this invitation is extended to a person who doesn't deserve the invitation. The people grumble because the Zacchaeus is a scoundrel in their view. Tax collectors were hated by Jews for a couple of reasons. First of all, they were considered traitors to their people because they were active collaborators with the pagan Romans who were occupying the Jewish homeland. And the second reason was because they stole from people. Tax collectors contracted with the state to collect the taxes, and they made their margin by collecting more than they were required to remit to Rome. And so it ended up becoming sort of like a, a legally sanctioned extortion that happened. And so they're seen as people who are both traitors and thieves. And the thief isn't just a tax collector, he's a head tax collector. So how much more for him? Now, in the Jewish law, there are laws that don't you know, come with the death penalty, but they say that the person who does them will be cut off from their people, meaning that they are excluded from the religious life of Israel. They're no longer welcome at the temple if they've done this. And so they can offer sacrifices to come and receive God's forgiveness. And so the Jewish community would look at this kind of person, a person whose actions would manifestly lead them to be cut off from the people, and they would look at that person as outside of God's grace. And yet it is precisely to this person that Jesus comes and offers forgiveness. A third observation that I want to make about the text is that Zacchaeus' natural response to Jesus' offer of grace is to change the way that he lives. It's never a transaction. Jesus doesn't say, okay, if, I, if you give up half of what you've got, and then you make restitution to the poor above and beyond what I, what I call for in the law, then I'll save you. No, he comes to Zacchaeus first. He offers him love and acceptance. And then Zacchaeus is set free to respond out of love Jesus has left his Zacchaeus to us a response of love coming out of Zacchaeus and back to Jesus. And we see this manifested by the fact that Zacchaeus extravagantly goes above and beyond. There's nothing in the law that says that a person has to give back half of their possessions to the poor. And if you've swindled somebody, you're responsible to give them back what you stole plus 20%. But he's offering a 300% tax. And so we see that there's something about this encounter with Jesus that has changed him. Jesus has become his treasure. I mean, Jesus has become Zacchaeus' treasure. Then his wealth, his former treasure, has lost its luster. He's freed from it so he can give it away without much thought. It's like that old song, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look forward in his wonderful place. And the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory. A fourth observation that I want to make about this text is that the fierce response to Jesus causes him to take up the calling that he originally had. Now, the fierce is a Jew, a descendant of Abraham, biological speaking. But he would be excluded from the community of God's people and Abraham's descendants on account of his actions. And Jesus affirms that this too is a child of Abraham. In other words, he says that Zacchaeus is welcomed back into the community of God's people. 
But there's more to it than that as well. Zacchaeus' name actually means poor. Many think that that is a prophetic insight from his parents about the calling that God placed on his life. A calling that Zacchaeus walks away from because the Zacchaeus that we encounter at the beginning of the story is anything but poor. But he becomes poor after his encounter with Jesus. Church tradition tells us that Peter appointed Zacchaeus to be the bishop of the church in Caesarea. He goes from being a collaborator with the Romans to being the head of the church in the place of the Roman capital. And even if he didn't want the job, Peter had to force him to take it. It shows that the person who thought so much of himself that he would be the head of this group of tax collectors is changed to the point where he doesn't want to put himself forward to be a leader in this new community of God's kings and redeemed people. Okay, so those are things that we see in Zacchaeus' story of repentance. But what can we draw out of that that might give us some insight into the process of repentance that we walk through? Well, just as Zacchaeus' forgiveness is something undertaken at God's initiative, so it is with us. You see, we are all sinners. We've all fallen into sin. Our lives have all twisted the calling that God has placed on our lives. We didn't think to ask God, hey, can you become incarnate and come down and dwell with us? I mean, like the peace, we don't bother asking because it's too much to ask for, and yet God does it by coming down incarnate in flesh. The second thing is that God offers grace to the ones who are excluded. Now, most of us here in this church are Gentiles, so we would naturally be excluded from God's covenant people in Israel. And what's more, some of us have lived very spotty lives. All of us have lived in perfect lives. And yet, God offers forgiveness to us. Sometimes I think that Jesus chooses the very worst offender in order to make a point about the depth of God's commitment to forgive and restore his people. And so he looks for a person that everybody would think is beyond the pale and Zacchaeus and offers grace and forgiveness to him because he knows that we might look and say, well, if he can forgive a person like that, then he can forgive a person like me. I think that's the same reason that he calls Saul a culture out of a life of persecuting the church to become the church's greatest mission. No matter how bad you've been, Jesus' invitation is open to you just as it was to you. Third, just as the Jesus' encounter with Jesus has a natural response that leads him to live differently, so I believe that when we encounter the 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 offering of God for forgiveness and reconciliation with faith, that we too will be transformed naturally as a response to His work in us. We can often talk about faith, or we say, salvation by grace through faith, but we over theologize faith. We make it about holding the right doctrine, but Jesus doesn't affirm Zacchaeus' wonderful new doctrine. He affirms that Zacchaeus' heart was transformed as evidenced by the change in his behavior. Faith is a belief that is so baked in that it translates into action. If I say I believe it's going to rain today, but I walk out of the house without my umbrella, it probably means I don't really believe it. If I did believe it, I would take steps appropriate with that belief. And so when we believe that Jesus is Lord resurrected and that he rules over all of creation, if we truly believe that in our bones, it affects the way that we live. Saving faith, then, calls us to a transformed life. It doesn't call us to the kind of faith that merely says, oh, I can sin all I want and simply ask Jesus for forgiveness. If that's my approach to faith, I don't think I have the kind of faith that the scriptures talk about, the kind of faith that saves us. The final observation that Zacchaeus was restored to his calling, I believe, is true of all of us as well. 
God calls Adam and Eve to be his image bearers, to represent him in his rule over all of creation. And they walk away from that calling by falling into sin. They cease to function in the way that they were supposed to function with regard to creation. But Jesus called the church to rule over creation. Now, in our day and age, this is often misinterpreted. But Jesus has an agenda, and we are supposed to enforce that agenda no matter what the cost. But that's not what it means to rule creation as an image bearer of God. Our rule and reign over creation is a participation with Jesus in his rule and reign over all of creation. Our power is delegated by God. And so it is only valid when it is in line with how God rules and reigns. God rules creation from the cross where he is in front. He doesn't dominate. He doesn't manipulate. He doesn't coerce. Instead, God rules creation by suffering and sacrificing for it. And so it is that God calls us to that vocation of being his representative by ruling over creation under his authority by serving and loving and sacrificing for others. But there's more to it than that as well. I believe that God creates each individual person with an eye to how that person can make a contribution to his kingdom. But God says, you know, this world would be a lot better if there was a person like this. And that is the design that your life was intended to have. But we are all sinners. We've all walked away from that calling, walked away from God's intention for our lives. But the good news is that when we encounter the risen Christ, He sets us free from the power of sin that keeps us from being that person, so that we are free to live the kind of life that God has always designed us to have. I believe that is the life that will bring us the ultimate joy and fulfillment and contentment. It doesn't mean that every time that we obey God, we will enjoy it and it will go easily for us to see this in the life of Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he wrestles with the calling to lay down his life on the cross and prays, Father, if there's any way, please take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but your will be done. But in the end, we read that Jesus took up the cross and scorned its shame for the joy set before him. In other words, it was all worth it. And so it is with us. If we allow God to work in us, He will set us free from sin and allow us to take up our original calling so that we can be His faithful image bearers in this world. And that in bearing God's image in this world, we will find the deepest sense of contentment and joy that is possible for us, even if along the way it is difficult, even if it is depressing, even if it causes us to sometimes lose. In the end, faithfulness will be in our hearts. And so, we see in Zacchaeus a picture of what repentance looks like. Not a realignment of our doctrine, but a transformation of our life in response to the wonderful things that God has done through Jesus. And so, just as Jesus stands at the base of that tree and looks up to Zacchaeus, he says, Zacchaeus, I want to come dwell with you. So Jesus is offering the same invitation to us. I want to come and take up residence in your heart. I want to be with you. I want to change who you are to set you free. And so when he comes and offers us that invitation, do we decline? Or do we act like Zacchaeus and receive it with joy? 